Alrighty, Katya, can we also do a, a voice check to check microphone levels and so on? Hey, can you hear me? You sound, you sound good. Okay. All right. So let's see. People, people here. I think it's the last day, so they're sort of trickling in. Let's plan to start at nine ten, um, and hopefully, um, yeah, we'll we'll be ready to go at that point. Is that okay, Katya? Nine ten. All righty, everyone. Welcome to our uh, final session, the ZTF Summer School 2023. Um, so uh, what's going to happen this morning? So we're going to get a talk from Katya, who I'll introduce in a second. Um, and then we're going to send out the um, the Google uh, survey review thing in which you tell us why this was great, bad, all that great kind of thing. I want to do that before everyone you know leaves. And then um, and then we're going to have Yashvi talking about uh, uh, automated low resolution spectroscopy and transient follow up and so on. Um, so to to introduce this speaker, so so Katya um, Katya is a postdoc at MIT, and she's an expert in anomaly detection, and in particular, applying it first in high energy physics, so working on CERN stuff, and has been more recently thinking about it for um, for gravitational waves. And so the, the reason that I wanted to have Katya talk today is, uh, one, we got some questions earlier in the week being like, how do I do rare transients? How do I find rare stuff? And so anomaly detection is clearly the answer. But uh, over the last year or two, we've been trying to build up some um, 
let's say collaborations with that community because the truth is the folks in um, CMS and Atlas, they're just a bit ahead of us in terms of applications of data science to their data sets. They've just, you know, uh, they've been at it for a bit longer. And so um, I'm really excited to have Katya here who, and I hope you'll take this talk kind of in the spirit of here's the kind of stuff that we should be thinking about as we look to identify the rare stuff in our, in our data, right? And, um, you know, be thinking about the ways in which you'd try to apply this to, to the alert streams we have. So, um, Katya, we're really glad to have you. Um, uh, I will move the, move you up here. We see your screen, great. And okay. you hear me well. And I and we hear you well. All right, here we go. Okay, great. So just one thing I wanted to mention that, yeah, I, I will talk about the anomaly detection in high energy physics in Eric with whom I work both on high energy physics and uh, LIGO stuff is gonna give uh, a great talk about the, the LIGO part of anomaly detection. So we are trying to fit in time and like split uh, the topics um, between us. But I will start and only talk about the anomaly detection of energy physics and what we do, why we do that, and how we do that. So first of all, like what do we do in particle physics? Uh, one of the things, main things that we're doing is searching for new particles. And those particles that we're searching for are those that are predicted by theorists. So you can imagine theorists like coming up with some new hypothetical particles we go and we look that for them in the experiments, but haven't found anything so far. Well, except for the Higgs, uh, which is great, but outside of standard model, nothing. And uh, why we need to look for new physics, why we want to look for these particles, why we need them at all, is that because we observe a lot of phenomena that are not explained with a standard model of particle physics. So I just mentioned a few things such as dark matter, dark energy, flavor puzzles, strong CP violation, white is not there, uh, hierarchy, biogenesis, and maybe more. So here I showed you the results of the CMS and Atlas mostly experiments. And those are searches for these hypothetical particles that theorists come up with. And you see like a lot of, a lot of regions are excluded, which says that like uh, we've searched a lot of space for these particles and we haven't found anything. So the dedicated searches were not successful so far. That's why we're looking into the different way of looking for this new particle in physics. So maybe it's time to accept that we don't know what to look for. Maybe theorists haven't like realized what we actually have to search, but you know, we have tremendous amount of data where the new physics may be hiding. We just don't know where to look for, for it. And so the idea with anomaly detection is to use the AI you know, machine learning algorithms to search for something that is just anomalous in our data. So we're not search for anything specifically motivated by specific theory, theoretical research, but just look for something that doesn't look like anything else. And it's just weird and anomalous in the data. So that's the basic idea and motivation why we want to do that in high energy physics. Now we do it at the LHC and um, I don't know your background, but I'm going to quickly mention that we collide protons at the LHC mostly. We have four main experiments where they collide and we see the product of collisions. And uh, this is how the one of, exper one of the biggest experiments looks like. So you see it's massive and there's like <clears throat> the protons collide here and then the, we detect the, product, the production of the total particles throughout the experiment with the electronics and we try to look for new particles there. Uh, so this is how a typical event would look like. So the proton collision happens here, and then the new particles are created, and we measure their energy, we can construct the tracks, and then do some analysis offline. So this is the basic idea of how we do it. And now there is a, well, as I call it, LHC big data problem, not necessarily a problem, but the thing is that we have uh, extreme amount of data, 
So the proton are colliding at 40 megahertz, so 40 million times per second. And each event is around 500 kilobytes. And that's an inc incredible amount of data that we are not able to all record and save on disk to analyze later. So we have to implement uh, quite tricky triggering system to reduce the this uh, rate, income rate of uh, events to something that we can save and analyze fully. And the system that does this uh, uh, reduction of the rate is called trigger. Uh, and then it's split to several levels. There is level one trigger and high level trigger, and then there is offline analysis. So the first level is implemented directly on on the hardware, so on the FPGAs itself, because when the event, uh, when the protons are uh, colliding so fast, we we have to like uh, disregard first the uh, factor of four hundred of events directly in the hardware. There is no other way, and then we have super slow processing time. How fast do we have to do that? And um, so yeah, in this first stage, which is happening directly in the hardware of the experiment itself, we reduce the rate by 400. And so, which means that the uh, 100 kilohertz of events pass through, but the rest are just thrown away forever and never analyzed. And new physics may be there. So then this 100 kilohertz enter the, the so-called high level trigger, where which has to perform a further reduction by 100 of the rate. And that's already as a, a farm, farms of CPUs and the processing time that is allowed is much larger, but typical event size is the same. And then the further reduction is done here. And then finally, one kilohertz is written down on disk and can be analyzed offline, where you can actually like uh, offline, you have some further reduction of the size of your data because you have a lot of background events that you're not interested in. And typically you have like 100 or 1000 events for your analysis. There is no time limit for processing. Um, you can do as many complicated things as you want. And there is usually like a smaller uh, event size. So the thing is that the, to reduce the rate from 40 megahertz to one kilohertz, we need to select events based on something, right? And right now, all this selection that's implemented in all the stages is based on these ideas of theoretical physics, which particle are to look for, right? So all the selection that we apply are specifically targeted to search for these particles. So what if we never consider the right model? What if we never apply the selection that is needed to find new physics and we're actually throwing it away I don't know, in the first stage or in the second stage, and we we'll never even get to look at this data offline when we analyze it. So the idea is that we can use uh, machine learning and search for anomalies directly in a trigger. Oh, of course, first of the way, and this is what already people have been doing, is applying uh, machine learning algorithms to search for something in an unsupervised manner in the offline analysis. And you can use however like and uh, you like in complicated large machine learning models. Uh, but as I mentioned, it can very likely be that you already throw away potential new physics somewhere uh, in your pre-processing or trigger system, right? So that's, people are doing that still. They're still uh, doing machine learning offline, but uh, it's not the all potential of the data that we have, right? And that's why there's also possibility, of course, to put uh, your machine learning algorithm is a high level trigger stage. As I mentioned, they, they're a CPU operated, so you can potentially do that. Uh, and you have higher chance to find new physics because um, as I told you, this high level trigger reduces the rate by Y hundred. So if you put some algorithm there, you have more chance to find new physics. But there's already some requirements on the latency. So how fast your algorithm has to make decision. So it has to be taken into account. So we currently all also also implement some algorithms in the high level trigger to see if we can improve our search space. And finally, um, finally, we want of course to put the anomaly detection directly in the first level of the trigger, level one trigger. And why? Because at this level, the anomaly detection will see 
all the data. So all the data that is ever produced at LHC will pass through the stage. And so if we are capable to detect this anomalies with uh, machine learning, then the full capability will be explored if we put our algorithm. However, it is extremely complicated because there is very strict latency requirement. So we have the algorithm has to make decision in five, 15 nanoseconds. And there is also research usage requirements because uh, as I told you, in level one, all the algorithms are implemented directly on the hardware. So we have FPGAs where they're implemented, still programmable gate arrays. And then there is many different algorithms that has to work in parallel. So you don't have unlimited uh, amount of resources uh, to work with. And then when you put your machine learning algorithm, you have to have a special software that will translate your machine learning algorithm into the something that can be put directly on the hardware. Uh, however, yeah, as I said, if you do that, your algorithm will see all the data. So what now moving, like switching topics a bit, uh, what exactly we say when we talk about unsupervised anomaly detection and like what kind of algorithms do we use? And one of the most common ones, both in industry and in, 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 in science for uh, anomaly detection is autoencoders. So idea I explained here is quite basic. You have some input. So this is as I showed you the typical uh, event that happening at the Large Hadron Collider in the experiments. And then you encode it using some encoder machine learning stuff into the latent space, which is smaller dimensionality than the input typically. So you kind of lose some information and then you pass this uh, uh, encoding in through the decoder and then you decode it um, into something that should look like similar to the input. And you can train this autoencoder algorithm to learn to, how to decode and encode, sorry, and decode the input. And you can train the algorithm typically on the events that you're not interested about, uh, which you usually call background, which are most of the events uh, at the LHC because most of them are background and interesting because interesting processes are pretty rare. And the thing is that once your autoencoder sees something that it was not trained on, something very different, it will fail to perform the encoding and decoding. And so you will see that decoded output is very different from the uh, original input of the autoencoder. This is the basic idea of how you search for anomalies. So if you plot the distribution of the loss, loss in our case is a distance between the input to the autoencoder and the output, the typical background not interested in not interesting event will have very different small distance between the input and output so it will be close to zero because the autoencoder was trained to reconstruct perfectly or close to perfect this type of events but once uh, in this plot sorry it's like poorly labeled but all of these colors are anomalous uh, once your encoder decoder model sees anomaly it fails to reconstruct it and the distance between the input and output will increase so you see for like potential anomaly these are not real this is simulated uh, the loss distribution is on average high so you can say uh, when you put this algorithm on the trigger everything like if my event will have a loss value a distance between the input and output higher than 1000 well, whatever uh, i will say that this event, I will mark this event as anomalous and I will trigger on it. So this is a basic idea. And you see that during the training, you never used information of what is anomalous event. So in this case, it's unsupervised. All you need, the information you need to train this kind of algorithm is only the background like uninterested events. And now there is a second part of the problem. Once we, let's say, develop the algorithm and train it, you have to actually put it in a hardware, as they said. So, uh, and not only you have to put it in a hardware, you have to compile with the strict requirements of the trigger, both in terms of latency and resources. So there are several techniques to compress your model. I'm not gonna talk about them, but if you're curious, like, yeah, you have to do that. And so after stem circles of, compressing and retraining your model, you finally have something that you like. And then there is this uh, software developed by physicists. Uh, it's open source, HLS for ML. HLS is high level synthesis. It's what you need to put your alg machine learning algorithm or any algorithm on a PGA, on the hardware. And ML is open. Um, okay, so this 
is like the whole workflow. After you train your model, you have to convert it to this HLS high level synthesis code. And only then you can put it on a PGA. So that's highly non trivial. And but this is something that's being uh, invested, investigated now at the LHC. And the whole pipeline will look the following way. So you have your detector, and there. 40 megahertz of data will go through your anomaly detection algorithm. So uh, your anomaly detection algorithm will see all the data produced. And then if the loss, the distance between the input and output is high enough, it will be triggered as anomalous and it will be saved for later processing. And so later on offline, you can perform some studies like data analysis with this. For example, you can do clustering. And if you find some unexpected cluster, you can investigate it further and perhaps you will discover new physics and new particles, hopefully. So, however, you can also use this kind of approach to monitor the detector quality because if something goes wrong in a detector readout, you will also discover anomalies, but it will not be physics anomalies, it will be anomalies because of detector glitches and stuff. So this approach has, this technique has several like nice, um, results that you can get from it. So yeah, that's a normal detection briefly for searching for new particles at the LHC and uh, how we use uh, unsupervised machine learning algorithm to do a normal detection. And this is the logo of the project that we're currently working on, where we put the algorithm axolotl into the trigger. And if you're curious to learn more, I, I linked just like, for example, you can contact me or I linked the video where my colleague explains very nicely in like much more details what I was talking about. So that's it. I don't know if we go with questions now, if there are any, or uh, or maybe after Eric's talk would be better. I don't know. So we do have some, I would call it LHC specific questions, Katya. So I think it makes sense to, to, um, to answer them out loud. Um, so can folks, in the chat, who who wrote questions in the chat? I know Eric is responding kind of by uh, by typing, but I think it's worth um, worth shouting them out. So, Meet, do you want to ask your question? And I don't know, Eric and or Katya can answer. Yeah, uh, sure. So uh, I understand that from the talk you uh, mentioned that these uh, models are being run on the uh, CPU cores. Uh, I think that they should be run on GPU cores because uh, they offer like even GPU cores in general have like GPUs in general have a high core uh, number than the CPU cores, and they are uh, much better at parallel processing during you know uh, these machine learning models. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Well, I think Eric already answered <laughs> this uh, this question. There is a like a problem that. It's not that easy to just go and choose what you're going to run on. Um, but yeah, so it was historically a CPU. But as I told you, like this, for example, algorithm that I was talking about, we're going to put on a FPGA even. So we're not even talking about GPU or CPU here. Uh, all right. Uh, also, you mentioned like we could talk to you if uh, you know we are interested in this. Uh, is, is your email somewhere? Do, do you have an email that I can reach out to you for? Oh, yeah, I I will put it in the uh, in the chat. All right, thank you, thank you so much. Okay. Krishna, do you want to shout out your your question to the as well? I think Eric Eric also pointed it out in the chat. So why don't um. Yeah, so why don't we keep pushing ahead? Uh, so Eric, you wanna check if you can share your screen and so on? Sure, hi there. All right, let me share here. All right. Okay, that's perfect. Okay, so just to just introduce a bit, I know that um, Katya mentioned this. So, uh, Eric's um, a graduate student at MIT, uh, working with Katya, Phil Harris, etc. Um, he's one of he's one of the few ones I know who are um, kind of at the 
overlapping these days between the multi-messenger community and the high energy physics community, which has yielded some really interesting um, kind of cross-pollination of these algorithms within um, on the multi-messenger side, especially. Um, and so, yeah, I'm really excited for, for Eric to talk a little bit about how, yeah, how we're learning to apply algorithms developed by the energy physicists within our um, within our team. Sure, yeah. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, so today I'm going to talk about kind of, it's a, it's a similar anomaly detection scheme maybe, but uh, uh, I would say we're taking it kind of a step further and maybe um, for people watching kind of in the in in the ZTF community, maybe this would be uh, another kind of tool in your toolbox for anomaly detection. Um, so I kind of wanted to start real quick with, uh, let's see, so a, a general kind of concept of what we're doing at LIGO. So we have our gravitational wave interferometers. Um, you basically send in a laser through some kind of beam splitter. The beam splitter travels, or the, the laser travels down two arms of your kind of interferometer um, and then reconnects at the beam splitter. And what happens is that you should have kind of constructive or destructive interference if one of your arms has changed in length. Um, so you have these interferometers placed all around the world now. Um, and, you know, different designs are going to be sensitive to different frequency ranges. But, you know, in the end, you're basically going to get some readout at some photo detector. Um, and this readout is going to be kind of a, a product of your detector noise, um, but also could have kind of signals uh, laying underneath this detector noise. Um, and so you're going to get kind of a time series, uh, this, this detector strain, we call it, as a function of time. Um, and then you're going to have kind of some auxiliary channels as well. And the auxiliary channels are maybe like environmental monitors and stuff like that. Um, but you know, for our intents and purposes, that the 1D time series strain is kind of the most important thing to look at. And so, you know, LIGO and Virgo have been really good at detecting their binary mergers. So here's a kind of a black hole, uh, binary black hole merger sample, so BBH sample. Um, and uh, what you can see is that uh, the, these black hole mergers have like a very distinctive kind of in spiraling. Then they have a merger that's kind of violent, and then they have a ring down. Um, and and the, these processes are studied very well. You know, there's a lot of theorists that have put a lot of work into developing kind of the equations that will govern these black hole mergers. And then similarly, we have like neutron star mergers, um, binary neutron star mergers, which are are similar. They're going to be higher frequency, um, uh, but you know, we have good equations governing these kinds of systems, and we can search for these kinds of mergers within Virgo, LIGO, and Virgo. Um, and so I kind of wanted to explain how the search pipelines go, just so just to show you, you know, how we're going to do it different differently in anomaly detection. So there's kind of two main methods. There's going to be your match filter pipelines, um, and the match filter pipeline is kind of what's currently state of the art within LIGO. Um, and so what match filtering does is it compares your incoming gravitational wave data to a bank of simulated waveforms, and they call these the template waveforms. And basically, you just do some kind of likelihood estimate on your on your incoming data, and and you see what kind of template waveform you're matching up with with the highest likelihood, and that's going to be your kind of uh, your your signal that you're matching up with, or or just background. Um, and so the problem with these match filter pipelines is that they're pretty computationally intensive. Um, they take a while, and it, it, the the main problem here is if you don't have a template waveform. Um, you're not going to be able to run your fit um, with a kind of a, a, a waveform that you don't have access to. Um, so you're not going to be detecting any kind of exotic events um, in this match filter pipeline. And then similarly, there's deep learning. Um, deep learning is going to probably use convolutional networks. Um, it's going to be parallelizable, parallelizable and fast for the MMA community. Um, but similarly, you know, your training data is going to need to be simulated kind of events that you're trying to detect. And so similarly, you're going to fail when you're trying to detect kind of strange anomalous events. Um, and I just wanted to shout out that the data set here is going to be non-trivial as well. So your length measurements are 10 to the minus 22 meters in the detector. Um, so your detector noise is going to be constantly changing, clouding the signal um, over here on the on the left, there's kind of a, a noise plus a little 
a, a compact binary coalescence signal. Um, so it, it, it can be beneath the, the noise. And then also there's gonna be detector glitches, um, which are going to be like really similar to your kind of signal sources. So glitches are occurring all the time in the detectors on the order of every 10 seconds. Um, and you wanna filter out these glitches as well, right? A glitch can look a lot like a, a you know, compact binary signal. So uh, with all of this, we get to the anomaly detection. Um, and so for our intents and purposes, uh, anomalies in the, in the LIGO, Virgo kind of sphere are gonna be kind of unmodeled waveforms. They don't have to be things that you don't specifically know about kind of in the high energy case, um, um, but they could be kind of, uh, you know, weird signals that, that are either computationally prohibitive to simulate, or we just don't know how to simulate them. Or they could just be from sources that we don't know exist. So the gravitational wave match filter pipelines have detected binary black hole mergers, neutron star mergers, black hole neutron star mergers, um, but they have not detected core collapse supernova, neutron star glitches, cosmic strings, and neutron stars collapsing to black holes, stuff like this. Um, so then we get to the unsupervised learning um, is the first step in kind of anomaly detection, like Katya explained. You basically take your autoencoder, you feed your input data, you you compress it, you decompress it. Um, and you know, in this compression space, you should be learning some kind of important features about your data um, is kind of the general concept of this autoencoder scheme. Um, and you know, you compare your model loss, um, which is gonna be the difference between the input data and the reconstructed data. And you set some kind of threshold for where you want to find your anomalies. Um, and so, you know, this is the high energy case, the plot that Katya just showed. Then we can do kind of the, the, the LIGO case for this, which is gonna be similar. You're just feeding in your, your detector strain to this autoencoder, and then you can set some kind of thresholds um, signified by this red dotted line. Um, and you can look for kind of gravitational waves that, that merge um, and they, they, they peak above this threshold because basically your, your autoencoder gets confused when it sees something that's not standard detector background. Um, and so um, both of these kind of methods are kind of generalizations of a, of a one-dimensional anomaly detection space. So you have a one-dimensional axis and you're looking for, you know, you're looking to exclude things in the background region. This is going to be our broccoli here. Um, and then you're looking to select things in the anomalous region. Um, maybe, you know, instead of vegetables, you're trying to identify fruits or animals, let's say. <laughs> Um, it'll make sense. Don't worry. Um, so then, you know, generalizing past this, maybe you can see now kind of where we're going. Uh, a one-dimensional anomaly detection space maybe isn't going to capture all of the physics, all of the knowledge that we have already as humans. Um, and so you can take this a little bit further and make a gravitational wave anomalous knowledge space, we call it, or the guac space. And so that's why we're using avocados, by the way. Um, and so, um, you know, you can build a, let's start here on the left, you can build a two dimensional guac space, which has one axis of background, so an autoencoder trained on background, um, but then you can also train a different autoencoder on signal, um, and you can build some kind of embedded space on the reconstruction loss of your two autoencoders. And so what's happening here is that, you know, your background events should lie at a low background loss and a high signal loss. And similarly, your signal events should lie at a low signal loss and a high background loss. So, you know, your background in BBHs, for example, can be part of your training set. Um, but then the idea is that kind of things like core collapse supernova should lie closer to your signals than to your backgrounds. And so you can make like kind of like hyperplane cuts, or I guess it would just be a line in this case, um, but in the 2D case. Um, but you can kind of make selection regions based on these kind of plane, planar cuts. Um, and then you can try and identify kind of your core collapse supernova. Um, and then, of course, your, your real kind of glitches are going to lie at high signal loss and high background loss. So that's what we have to duck up here. Um, so then you can generalize this again and you can keep going. But really, the, the, it captures well in the 3D guac space. Um, you have a, a background trained autoencoder and maybe two signal trained autoencoders. And so you can train with 
you know, background versus BBHs versus sign Gaussian injections. Um, and what happens is the more you partition up this kind of embedded space, the better selection you get for your anomalous events. Um, so, so we're trying to, you know, get these core collapse supernova um, out and we're trying to, you know, figure out where they lie in our data. If we provide more signal to our embedded space, um, maybe these core collapse supernova are going to kind of uh, uh, take up uh, their own specific region in the embedded space. Um, and so then you can make, you know, these hyperplane kind of selections um, and try and look for, you know, your avocado, your core collapse supernova um, versus all the different types of signals. Um, you're using kind of the signals as some kind of prior for um, your, your um, anomalous kind of signal you're looking for. Um, and so we kind of went overboard with this and we went to like seven dimensions. Um, we found that seven dimensions was going to be useful because we needed um, some autoencoder to learn binary black hole mergers, also sign Gaussians at low frequency and high frequency, and then autoencoders for, you know, encoding and decoding backgrounds and glitches. Um, and then on top of that, we can add in some kind of correlation metrics that occur um, that, that, you know, you can take interdetector correlation in the, in the time domain and in the frequency domain. And so you put all of these together um, and then you make some kind of hyperplane cut. This is the train coefficients and you get some kind of final metric, which the value of the final metric doesn't really matter. But what you want is a final metric that will dip, you know, when you have a, an anomalous event. Um, and so you can set some kind of false alarm rates on how, how frequently you dip to these, um, these metric values. And so, you know, basically you just look for, you know, kind of, a, you know, another kind of triggering threshold, but, you know, combining a lot of different, uh, uh, um, uh, combining a, a 7D anomaly detection space into this final metric. Um, and so here is kind of a 4D, I kind of made an animation of a 4D um, space just so you could kind of see what it looks like. So here on the left is a binary black hole event um, and it's in blue. Um, um, it's, the, it's kind of the blue region of the space. And so um, you can see that this dot as the, as the merger comes through, it drifts over to the blue region of the space where the black holes are supposed to envelop this embedded space. Um, and then similarly on the right, there's sine Gaussian injections. So when a sine Gaussian um, signal comes through, it's supposed to kind of drift to this red region of the space, which it does. Um, so this is really good. Um, and then similarly, kind of, we test this out on supernova simulations, and we find that supernovas are actually very well captured by sine Gaussian injections. And specifically like high frequency sine Gaussian injections um, are going to, um, are going to have a, a large contribution in this embedded space. And as you can see right here on the top, uh, the, the signal is kind of non-trivial to detect, um, but um, here in the yellow, the sine Gaussian autoencoder is really uh, picking up the slack for everybody else. Um, so yeah, with that, um, you know, you can make your detection efficiency plots. You can plot how frequently you're detecting kind of supernovas or white noise bursts or black hole mergers. Um, I guess the numbers here don't really matter to you guys, but I, I think um, for some conclusions, I think anomaly detection is a you know really interesting developing field in both high energy um, and and uh, gravitational wave physics. Um, we're, we're going to be using them differently though in in each regime. You know, high energy is really like statistic uh, a statistical kind of field where we have a lot of events. We have uh, hundreds of millions of events coming through. Um, and you're looking for kind of a bump in this statistics, while a uh, gravitational wave, you know, we only have, you know, one or two events per day. Um, so um, that is to say that, you know, all experimental setups, even you guys can use these anomaly detection kind of um, methods for detecting unknown signals. And it might be kind of the 1D space, or you could go to, you know, this seven dimensional embedded space. And also that embedded spaces are cool. So. <laughs> Uh, that thanks thanks for listening. Um, any questions? I okay. Can't. Now that I've unmuted, we can we can clap. Okay. All right. Clap 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 clap. All right. That was a really nice pair of talks, both of you. Um, <laughs> questions for Eric and or Katya at this point. 
And I just want to say very clearly out loud, I really think that for some graduate student out there, there is a very nice project here to apply some of these principles for finding rare transients in our survey streams, right? We, you can naturally imagine, um, you know, building spaces for, you know, supernovae TDEs and everything else, and then going to look for the, the really cool rare stuff. So there's, you know, whoever is online in the room, you should be thinking about this because there's big opportunities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Any questions for, for folks? Anything online? Okay, if not, huge thank you to both of you. Um, this was this was really nice. Um, okay, so and Eric, can you maybe point to um, any open any of the stuff of yours that's open source for for folks? Um, yeah, we're 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 putting out our paper right now, so I can um I can drop a uh, we're we're planning on making everything kind of open source. Uh, so I can drop the link to our repo here in the chat. Um, yeah, it's awesome. Okay, so the the plan is um, so Andrew and or Kay are going to drop the the link to the 